My name is Kate Willett. I am from the Humane Society of the United States. I coordinate something called the Human Toxicology Project Consortium, and one of the aims of that consortium is to promote um, pathway-based approaches to toxicology. So we have developed with uh, Christy Sullivan at PCRM this program. We started last year with a program called AOPs 101, which was for people who had heard about AOPs but didn't really know uh, how to relate it to their own work or how to get started. And that program was pretty successful. We ran it a couple times and it was very well received. And then there were a few workshops in 2014 that focused on trying to take the AOP concept a little further into um, applications in decision making and how you might do that. So we uh, developed this AOP's 201 program, which goes a little further than um, the 101 program did, more into discussing the way you assess information in AOPs and the context in which AOPs might be useful to assist in decision making. So, let's see. In my presentation, I am just going to provide an overview of pathways and the ideas about how they can be used in decision making and just provide um, an introduction really to the rest of the speakers this afternoon. So my talk will cover a little bit about some of the drivers for this um, need for this uh, pathway-based approach to uh, toxicology. And then I will just br briefly mention some of the things that risk assessors need to do in their daily life. And then I'll talk a bit about how pathway-based approaches could help support those needs. I'll do a very brief overview of how to begin with AOPs and talk a little bit about the, the OECD, EPA, JRC um, tools that are available, and those will be dealt with in detail in, in some of the talks this afternoon. And then I'll briefly introduce the two case studies that will be presented this afternoon. Okay, so it's been considered for a long time that um, improvements are needed in the way we do risk determinations, and this really spans the spectrum of chemical sectors. So these are just a few examples of some of the drivers for a need for change. Um, from the pharmaceuticals area, there's still a high failure rate of pharmaceuticals, even after a lot of investment and assessments, and this is largely due to a failure of translation from the preclinical to the clinical um, assessment stages, in a large part due to a lack of efficacy or unforeseen toxicity in the clinical trials. And this is after spending several billion dollars, more than a decade, on a particular chemical. So clearly there's room for improvement there and a great need for improvement. The pesticide sector has similar concerns in that to register a pesticide requires a lot of testing, millions of dollars of investment, at least 10,000 animals, again, a decade or more of, of assessment. And there's also a lot of desire to identify greener chemistries, um, alternate chemistries for uh, pesticides, and that needs to be done in a more efficient way than we have been historically doing it. Industrial chemicals, um, there has been over the past couple of decades, growing concern over the lack of information about a lot of chemicals. There could be, you know, 10,000, 80,000 chemicals that are in the environment or in commerce right now for which we have very little information, and people are concerned about this. This has resulted in large-scale scale regulatory programs, the most advanced of which is REACH, which you all probably know about. And it's asking for a lot of information about thousands of chemicals, so suddenly we need to generate a whole bunch of information about a lot of different chemistries. And there are um, similar programs being developed in other regions in the world. Cosmetics, uh, there's two um, sort of competing forces going on in the realm of cosmetics. One is um, an increase in consumer concern over exposure because women wear cosmetics and people are very intimate with their personal care products. They uh, have high long-term exposure to these things. Um, even though they're relatively, I mean, they're safe, but it's still some concern over the level of exposure. At the same time, um, people, there's 
a big consumer drive to not test these things on animals. And that's resulted in a ban in testing and sales of cosmetics ingredients in the European Union and the implementation of similar legislation around the world. So you, you have a safety concern, you can't use animals anymore. So there are many drivers that affect every aspect of the, of the chemical sector. Well, what do risk assessors need to do when they make a decision? Generally, they have to use many different kinds of information. Um, they have to weigh this information in terms of relevance and reliability. Um, they have to assess and document the confidence they have in this information, and as well as the assumptions that they make um, around uh, some of the places where they don't have information. Um, and they really need to acknowledge the uncertainties that they have in a given decision. Understanding and decreasing uncertainty is a critical aspect of effective decision making and um, pathway-based approaches can be used to, to help this in many ways. So what is a, what is a pathway-based approach? Just briefly, I, I assume you all know this already. Um, uh, adverse outcome pathway, as it's come to be known in the toxicological field, is a biological map from the molecular initiating event, whether that's a chemical binding a receptor or a chemical covalently uh, interacting with the DNA or a protein, through the intermediate events at the cellular tissue organ, organismal levels, all the way to the resulting adverse outcome. It includes a, d a description of the mechanism or mode of action. Okay, and AOPs can, the use of AOPs within a decision context can decrease uncertainty by providing a framework for collecting and organizing and evaluating, quantifying all of this information that goes into the decision process. In this way, you can also uh, transparently catalog the confidence that you have in this information. Um, you can also transparently weight the information in order to support this weight of evidence decision. Um, it also provides a framework for developing assessment approaches that are based on querying these key intermediate events. For example, um, integrated approaches to testing and assessment. It can also, a well-developed AOP can allow you to do computational modeling in a number of different ways to actually predict uh, safety or hazard with known uncertainty or confidence. Okay, so just a brief overview of how one begins to build an adverse outcome pathway. Um, you can start anywhere along the pathway, depending on where you have the most information or where your area of interest is. Uh, it begins with a liter literature search and investigating all of the databases to, to gather all the known data about the adverse, I'm sorry, about the molecular initiating event, about any of the key events and the adverse outcome, and any of the relationships that you know about those things. Just, just start somewhere. Um, there, and then you compile and evaluate this information, and there's guidance that's been developed to help you through this process. The OECD has developed guidance for um, adverse outcome pathways, building and evaluating adverse outcome pathways. Um, there is some guidance that's been developed through the WHO IPCS um, mode of action framework. And there are recent publications from uh, recent workshops in 2014 that have gone into this a little um, in more detail. If you would like these references, just let me know. I can send them to you. Um, okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the OECD EPA JRC AOP project, if that's enough acronyms for you. Um, so the, the o OECD has decided to take on AOPs in a rather large way. Um, and they have developed this guidance that I mentioned before, and these, these groups of people uh, listed at the bottom, along with OECD, the US um, Army Corps, EPA, and um, the Joint Research Center, are building um, a, 
interactive database, one element of which is the AOP wiki, which you're going to hear a lot more about today. And that is a piece of software that will allow you to store and, and collate all of the information that supports your adverse outcome pathway and the relationships between the elements. OECD has also developed a user's handbook specifically for the AOP wiki to help you enter the information into the various um, fields that the, the software has. The AOP wiki is part of a larger collection of tools known as the AOP knowledge base. Uh, some other elements besides the AOP wiki are the intermediate effects database. This is a place to store everything you know about a particular intermediate event. Uh, and these can be then reused to populate different pathways if they're if the pathway is related to a pathway that's already been um, documented. Uh, and Effectopedia, which we're going to hear more about today, which um, I understand is a relational knowledge base that allows you to um, add quantitative information about the relationships between the various elements in an AOP and also the context of the AOP, for example, whether it's um, you know, species specificity, sex, developmental stage. So it's got many dimensions to it, and we'll hear much more about that from Haristo. So um, the next set of talks um, will be by Stephen Edwards, Ed Perkins, and Haristo. Huh. I'm sorry, I'll do I don't know how to pronounce your last name, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so they will talk in detail about this knowledge base. Okay, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the context in which AOPs can be helpful. There are a number of different kinds of decisions that have to be made in terms of, um, in the process of chemical assessment, whether it's regulatory or just, or preclinical or whatever. Um, so, and these are just a few examples. And the utility of the AOP can be related to the mm, substantiation that you have for that AOP. Uh, put another way, the problem formulation or the decision you have to make will uh, determine the use of the AOP and therefore how much substantiation you need for that particular AOP. Um, and these are just some examples. So. For example, a AOPs or mechan mechanisms or modes of action have been used to support chemical categories. And in that case, you would like to know an awful lot about the molecular initiating event, and you want to know that it's connected somehow to an adverse outcome. But the major part of your information is going to be around that, um, the upstream end of that pathway. If you want to use your, your AOP to support hazard identification, you would like to have a little more information about um, more than one upstream event and to have fairly decent substantiation that it's related to an adverse outcome. Also, your, your upstream events should be assayable because you want to be able to evaluate your chemical. Um, Okay, uh, let me skip down to, so in quantitative risk assessment, if you were to use the AOP primarily or entirely to support a quantitative risk assessment, you would want that AOP to have a lot of substantiation. You would want to know a lot about the relationships between the elements in that, of that AOP and the adverse outcome. In fact, you would want to have kinetic data, you would want to have dose response data, you, you would like to have a lot of information. And, and hopefully also probably information about related pathways or choice points that that pathway might have. To look at that a different way, um, the regulatory or decision, the decision utility for an adverse outcome pathway can be related to the amount of certainty that you have in the pathway and the amount of certainty that you have um, is directly related to the amount of information that you have for that pathway. This slide, I want to put a couple of caveats around this slide. Um, this slide describes uh, the describes pathways at different levels of description. In the second column here, correlative, quanti qualitative, qualitative, and I, I, the point I want to make is that that is not a dis those are not discrete things. The AOP. Characterization is a continuum. There's not really any discrete place where it's this or that. 
Um, the other thing I'd like to point out is that I, I don't want to leave you with the impression that in order to do quantit in order to use an AOP in quantitative risk assessment, you have to have a quantitative AOP. I don't think that that's necessarily the case. You have it. You just need to know. So you can an AOP at any stage of development can be helpful in any decision, but. If you're making a decision with high consequences and you have an AOP with low certainty or low information, you will need a lot of other supporting information. You can't rely entirely on the AOP. Um, and in the uh, right-hand column are some examples of pathways that are at currently at different stages. Of course, as time goes on, this will all change. The more information you have, your pathway evolves over time. There is no done AOP. AOPs will, or pathways or networks will just continue to um, improve. Um, and, oh, the other point I want to make is that you know, no matter how you use your AOP, what's really important is that you understand the uncertainty of the information underlying your AOP the the uncertainty in the relationships between the key events and the adverse outcome, and um, your overall confidence that the AOP is is true and and how complete it is. And Betty Meek will be talking about approaches to um, start to evaluate that. Okay, and the two examples of AOPs that we're going to hear about today will be, um, first, the aromatase inhibition leading to reproductive impairment. This is a very well-described adverse outcome pathway with a lot of quantitative information underlying it. Um, and Wan Young Cheng will be presenting that. Um, and then our second uh, example will be presented by Christy Sullivan. And this is um, an AOP for sensitization of the respiratory tract. This is a relatively new AOP, but it's related to an AOP that is fairly well described, which is skin sensitization. So those will be our two examples. And I'll just quickly summarize um, sort of what I said, which is um, that AOPs, or pathway-based approaches, can be used to reduce uncertainty in a number of ways, including by weighting or quantifying information. They can also be used to indicate the most appropriate or valuable tests to use in an assessment in an IATA, for example. Um, Overall, they'll increase the efficiency and effectiveness of chemical assessment and eventually, well, even now, currently, and eventually increase to increasingly reduce the reliance on um, information from animal studies. 